Hello and welcome to this special episode of the Career Success Podcast. I'm Jason Connolly. And in this episode, which is titled, Why Only 20% of Lawyers Achieve Their True Potential and How Can You Achieve Yours? I'm delighted to be joined by Bill Komodoy from New York City in America. I spoke to Bill a few episodes ago on the Career Success Podcast about his background, his life, his career, how he's got to where he is, and his backstory is absolutely incredible. It's a great conversation, and I'd suggest anyone that's got an interest in business or sales definitely listens to that. Um, Bill, we also talked about actually how he brought Microsoft in uh, as a client to his marketing and media agency when it was only an SME size, and that story in itself is fascinating to hear. To anyone that doesn't know Bill, Bill's a corporate trainer. He's also a mental fitness coach these days, and he's had some epic adventures. From becoming a top 100 sales influencer to standing next to Tony Robbins as he rang the opening bell for NASDAQ. And he's even recently actually done an Iron Man, 104 mile Iron Man. Incredible. Um, Bill has founded and successfully exited two highly profitable and award winning multi million dollar marketing agencies. With over 25 years of marketing experience, he has been in the digital marketing industry since its inception in 1994. He's also built the first commercial websites for AT&T, CVS, Mastercard and the Coors Brewing Company. The purpose of Bill's life these days is to be an inspirational leader who solves problems and creates breakthroughs for himself and others. Bill was also a former columnist for both Inc. and Forbes magazines, having written over 350 articles. And Bill, thank you so much for joining me on this special episode titled Why Only 20% of Lawyers Achieve Their True Potential and How Can You Achieve Yours? I am so happy to be here, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Now, in your introduction, I obviously said to anyone that wants to find out the ins and outs of you to go back and listen to that. But the conversation was fascinating, Bill, about what you've done, what you've been through, um, the stories you've got about bringing in these big clients. Um, all fascinating. And I'd say to anybody that wants to, um, you know, have a good well, that's interested in business or sales, go back and listen to that episode because it's fascinating. But that's not why we're here today, Bill. We're here today nope. to talk <laughs> about lawyers. And, uh, you know, not just lawyers, also people in general, but you know, 20, only 20% 20 of people achieving their true potential. Talk to me about that. How, how, how have you come to that stat? Yeah. So here's, so this is actually a, a research that has been done by Shirzad Jameen, who is the uh, New York Times bestselling author of Positive Intelligence. And just to give you some statistics. So this was done with hundreds of CEOs and their executive teams, Stanford students, world-class athletes, and 500,000 participants from over 50 countries. And so this is a massive comprehensive research study that also includes positive psychology, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and performance science all wrapped into one. So this is like yeah. a really breakthrough approach. And what I'll tell you is the category that we're putting all this under is mental fitness. And so let me give you a definition mm. and we'll play with this. Mm. Sure. The definition of mental fitness is your capacity to respond to life's challenges with a positive rather than negative mindset. This impacts your peak performance, which is what we're going to be spending most of our time talking about today, but it also impacts your peace of mind, your wellness, and healthy relationships. And so why we can confidently say is that we have this statistically, and this is all outlined in Shirzad Shamin's book, uh, The Positive Intelligence, and it really gets into this. And I want to apply this directly to lawyers. So how can lawyers achieve their true potential when, when only 20% are actually doing so? And so I'm going to let you lead and drive. You'll be the voice of any of the listeners and your lawyers who are actually in this, this process. But to your point, it's beyond lawyers. It's anyone who's actually experiencing not hitting their peak performance. The conversations we're going to have today will impact them. But I'm specifically tying it to the legal community because I know the kind of stress they're under and some of the challenges they face. So I want to make sure that we're very concrete and explicit in our examples. And we'll be using examples from the legal profession today. I'm absolutely one fascinated already and I'm uh... I'm primed like a coiled spring, Bill, listening. So uh, <laughs> over to you. All right. So so the first thing that people ask is, where does this come from? And, and I'll, I'll just give you this foundation because it'll, it'll come up in the examples we use today. Uh, this is the power of factor analysis. This is the root cause. And this results in radical simplification, which is, if you think about it, the best example I could give you is imagine all of the thousands of colors, or if you're in digital, the millions of colors wow. that can be created from only three factors, red, blue, yellow. 
With red, yeah. blue, and yellow, you can create millions of digital colors and thousands of actual real physical colors, right? And so the idea there is, how does that apply to mental fitness? Well, there's only three core muscles at the root of mental fitness. It's your saboteur, interceptor, your sage, and your self-command muscles. And so we can go as deep into this stuff as you want, but at a high level, it's really, really simple and it's elegant in its simplicity. You have 10 saboteurs and five sage powers. And essentially, anytime you're experiencing negative self-talk, you are being driven by your saboteurs. And anytime that you are in your peak performance, you're in your sage. And you can actually measure this. Oh. If you go to positiveintelligence.com slash, oh, oh, let me give the full URL in a second, but it's, it's I was going to say the slash program gives you the details of what the actual program is, but what I'm going to yeah. share with you is the actual assessments. Oh, that's what it is, positiveintelligence.com slash assessments, duh. <laughs> Try to keep it simple. <laughs> little, little, little. We'll, um, we'll repeat this at the end of the show because yeah. I want to do it myself. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, even I'm not prime with the pen right at this very moment. <laughs> no, it's great. So, we'll so come back the, to that. I'm sharing this with you because there's two assessments that you'll find on the yeah. website, and, and I think lawyers will find this really fascinating. The first one is your saboteur assessment, which actually tells you what are your top two saboteurs um, out of the 10. So there's 10 out there. And the other assessment is your PQ assessment, which actually tells you your positive intelligent quotient on a scale of one to 100. And so the interesting thing about it is, is it's the, the PQ muscle actually measures the amount of time you are in positivity versus the amount of time you are in negativity. Now, what's really interesting about that is that you would think it's anything above 50, you would be in a good space, but it's actually the vortex, it actually hits at 75% or higher. And the reason why is, is that our brain stems are wired for negativity, which means our brains were not created to make us happy, they were created to make us safe. So anytime yeah. someone says a negative comment or somebody actually uh, challenges you, it literally affects you at your limbic system, right? This is the fight or flight uh, mechanism. And so yeah. you are much more prone to judgment of others or negativity coming from somebody else. And it activates your amygdala, which it activates your entire fight or flight system and reflex. And this is especially true in the legal profession. And you think about all the different places where uh, clients are completely activated when they show up at a, at a law firm, right? They are just fed up. The reason that they're going to go sue somebody is because they are completely fed up with what happened and they're ready. They're out for blood, right? So most clients yeah. are showing up as saboteurs, right? They're not coming in their sage. Now, you don't arrive at a lawyer for nor sometimes there's something positive. I guess there could be a deal, but even that in itself, if it, even if it's well, so deal, that's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this is why this is such a fun episode, right? So so the idea is, is that, you know, when people are in their saboteurs, they're in their brainstem, their limbic system, the left part of their brain. When they're in their sage, they're in the middle prefrontal cortex where they have all their empathy circuitry and they're in the right side of their brain. Now, what we're going to do is show you how to actually shift someone from the left to the right. But just by default, the probably the, the small percentage of time that a lawyer's clients are in sage are when they're proactively thinking about the future. So that could be the initial contract that's being written, or they're thinking about, you know, a new partnership. And so obviously, there's so many variations of different types of law, you know, we're not going to get into all those today. But the nuance here is when somebody's being proactive and thinking about what could possibly go wrong, or some of the ways that they want to mitigate risk, that's oftentimes yeah. coming in sage. But that's what you'll see is, is that that's coming from a place of things like curiosity, like what could happen, creativity, right? There's some passion, there's purpose, there's empathy, there's all these things that happen in the sage quadrant when you're there. But most of the time, when you're getting activated by your saboteurs, you're motivated through your negative emotions. That's your fear, your stress, your anger, your guilt, your shame, your insecurity. So how often are lawyers interacting with clients that are in fear? They're stressed out. They're angry. They, they feel guilty for whatever that has happened or hasn't happened. Some sort of shame or insecurity. All of that is being protected by the legal profession. And so one of the challenges that lawyers face disproportionately to other professions is that they are constantly working with clients that are in their cyber mode, which means they have to work doubly time for their own mental fitness in order to stay sage yeah. when their clients are losing, their, losing themselves. That makes but sense. they don't all the time. They, if, if anything, they're working longer hours than ever to to unravel, uh, you know, whatever matter or mess it might be. 
Exactly. So what might be helpful at this stage is to share with you what are the actual 10 saboteurs. And I think most of your listeners will immediately self-identify, but this is actually the five minute assessment I was talking about the, 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 uh, on positiveintelligence.com. Mm. When you go to the oh. assessments, if you do your saboteur assessment, it literally takes five minutes. It's totally free and it'll tell you what your top saboteurs are. But I guarantee wow. you, as I'm describing them, then you, you, I'm sure, will say, I know exactly which my top ones are. You know, I'm sure that will happen. Well, <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure lawyers that are listening will also be hearing it themselves. All right. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. So the first one is the judge. Everyone has the judge. All right. So this is, we're going to talk about the, the nine accomplice saboteurs, and that's what the saboteur assessment focuses on. But every single one of us has the judge. And there are three types of judgment, judgment of self, judgment of others, and judgment of situations. And so yeah. what's in what's really important in that is that the judge activates other people's judge. So if I come at you, right, and I start judging you and saying, oh, this is, this is a terrible episode of the podcast, rah, right? And I start <laughs> judging you, right? You yeah. take it personally, and there's two things oh. you react. You either judge yourself and say, maybe he's right. Oh my God, I'm feeling like an imposter right now. He called me out, right? There's that judgment of self. Or it could be judgment of me. Like that idiot doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know. What does he know anything about podcasts? Right. Or it could be judging the situation. It's like, oh, we just picked the wrong topic and I'm really sorry. Da, da, da. But all the point is, it doesn't matter which part of the swirl is occurring. The judgment activates somebody else's judge. And so how often yeah. this happens right? In these experiences that you experience judgment. And so you become defensive or I be, I experience judgment. I become defensive. I start to think about all the things that I want to do to protect myself. And that is usually yeah. how the rest of the saboteurs show up because the first one is going to be your judge followed by your top one or two accomplice saboteurs. Okay. So yeah, makes sense. Here it goes. Number one, controller. Right. This is the controller saboteur, which basically it needs to be in control of everything. You have the hyper achiever, which constantly is looking at the next reward. You've got the saboteur restless, which cannot sit still. There's always something going on. They have to do something else and they just can't focus. Then you have the rest, the, the stickler and the stickler is always looking at why things aren't perfect and constantly looking for absolute perfection in everything they do. You have the pleaser. That's constantly give, 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 give until they're totally depleted. And then they're, then they lash out. And then you have the hyper vigilant, always waiting for the next shoe to fall. And then you have the avoider, which keeps putting work off until it just can't be avoided anymore. You have the victim who's experiencing this, I would imagine happens a lot with lawyers, clients, they feel victimized, which is why they want to have uh, oh. some recourse. And then hyper rational, which is complete logic, which is always looking at what the logical answer is everything and they are almost devoid of emotion. None of these attributes are, are seeming particularly positive at this stage. No, that's right. None of them are. So, <laughs> so these are all the negative saboteurs, right? right? Okay. And what your, your sage is your positive side. So you have five right. sage powers. We'll talk about that in a second. But what I want curious about when I say controller, hyperachiever, restless, stickler, pleaser, hypervigilant, avoider, victim, hyperrational, which one or two come to the top for you? For me personally, I, mm -hmm. I think that... Uh, what was the first one in regards to um, controller? I, I think I'm a, yeah, I think I, I can be a controller, but I think that's you know an attribute that a lot of people who run a business have. Yes, but I, I do think I have elements of being um, a perfectionist and yep. getting stuck on a little detail when you know I think that's another quality exactly um, as well. So you know I, I, they were definitely resonating with me there where you were when you were saying them. But I, I'm assuming that those are kind of attributes which a lot of people and leaders might have yes exactly so the top three it's your own business you don't you know you want exactly to be perfect that's the way you kind of want things uh, to be and it's that you know that's why a lot of people i guess have their businesses held back because they can't scale up because they're not possible you've got them. it yeah. you've got it so so basically in the in a law firm your typical oh. the 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 owners you know the partners of the law firm are typically uh, some hybrid of controller and hyperachiever controller and stickler or stickler and hyperachiever it's sort of the triad now it doesn't mean they can't yeah. also be you can find partners who are hyper vigilant who've been successful because they're constantly looking for how they're going to get screwed 
screwed over, right? And so that that can happen too. So there's lots of other executive team members that you'll find from everything from hyper rational to uh, even pleaser and restless. You'll see a lot of those show up in the executive boards. But by and far, most experience their controller, their hyper achiever, and their stickler. Because if you own a business, your controller is the one that's like, I don't trust anyone else. I'm going to make this happen for myself. And you basically become Aww. an entrepreneur. You start a company. The hyper achiever is all the merit badging that goes along that process, all the rewards that you experience. And the stickler is constantly looking for perfection. So yeah, the, I think I'm, the hyper achiever is jumping out at me as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. So well, almost everybody yeah. experiences these things. But the question is, you know, here's here's what, what I often get here after I reveal this. The very next question most people ask is, aren't negative emo emotions good for you? And that's like, well, you know, I'm motivated by them. And I hear this all the time in executive teams. Like my controller has helped me because I work with a bunch of people who are frankly incompetent asses, right? They don't know what they're doing. And so anytime there's something serious, I need to take the ball and run with it. And that's what the controller lie is. Same thing with the stickler. It's like, well, of course I'm a perfectionist. Like our, our clients will not accept anything less. Can you imagine making even the smallest error in a legal document? Like there's, there's so much money on the line. Right, so I feel like I'm going through a journey of discovery with you now, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> I think you feel it, actually, right? Yeah, well, I can because I, I, I think the good thing is, is I, I, I've heard of elements of this before, but not the whole thing. So I feel like I'm going on this journey with you. Yes, now, but, exactly. But, you know, one observation I'm already noticing is surely a sprinkle of that is a good thing, but it, does it come down to moderation? Or well, so this is it. So, so are negative emotions good for you? I would ask the same question of, is pain good for you? And I would explain this in the context of the way you sensate, you experience pain when your hand is on a hot stove. So that little, tsk, ah, right? Yeah. So a little bit of negative emotion is great for an alert system, right? So what I want to distinguish is this idea is that negative emotions are only helpful for about one second as an alert signal. When you stay in negative emotion, it hurts your ability to see clearly and respond with empathy, curiosity, creativity, and laser-focused action. So the negative emotions are your saboteurs. This makes it super simple to understand, am I in a place of negativity or positivity? And that allows us to really understand, are we driving from a place of our sage or are we driving from a place of our saboteurs? Make sense? Mm. Yeah, makes total sense. Really fascinating. So let's shift over for one second. You know, so let's talk about the sage because it helps people understand the context, right? That the idea of the sage perspective, you know, what is the sage perspective? And the first thing I'll say tell you is that the saboteurs might generate success, but it will not generate happiness. The sage generates your highest success and sustained happiness. And so this is the idea of how do you actually motivate through positive emotions of empathy, curiosity, creativity, passion, and purpose, right? And so that's that's the part where we start to go okay this this lives in the the sage lives in the brain associated with positive emotions with peace and calm clear headed focus creativity and the big picture and it operates from that sage perspective so the idea is this is this might actually challenge you which i love the sage perspective is that every outcome or circumstance can be turned into a gift and an opportunity right and what i'm already spotting here is which, you know, I guess is kind of feeding into why only 20% of lawyers achieve their full potential because of the fact that most people don't live in that, that That's positive it. frame of mind all the time. It, it's, you know, I, I, I guess now we've gone through a stage of identifying Bill, it's, it's actually trying to find out how you can stay in that. that exactly. That positive state as well. and, and Jason, we'll definitely hit that. But I want to I want to share with you, this is actually one of the things that blows most people's minds. When you start to say that every outcome or circumstance can be turned into a gift or an opportunity, this is where the biggest challenges show up. It's like, no, 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 that's not possible. You know, I, I got a, a guy stiffed me for, you know, $100,000 or, you know, I got screwed out of this. I mean, this is really where law, law firms have thrived through all this type of, of tort law and, and the liabilities that are associated with it. And yet, if you step back, you start to look at, how could every uh, outcome or circumstance be turned into a gift or an opportunity? So I'll give you the example. I went through this when COVID first began, right? So in March you know, of, of 2020, and it really became clear that we had to shut everything down. I went to this stage perspective because I've been work working with this platform for a while. And I'm like, okay, so if every outcome or circumstance can be turned into a gift or an opportunity, what is the gift and what is the opportunity of, the, of a global pandemic? I mean, that's not an easy question, right? Well, no, it's not. It's, it's, 
<laughs> I'd love to know the answer and what you yeah. uh, what using this method has done in terms of your thinking at that time. Totally. Well, so it it did it transformed everything. So what I did is I started to look at this and I said, okay, I know what the negative things are. Okay, I'm stuck at my home. I feel like I'm on house arrest. I mean, I could go negative very easily. So the question was, yeah. what can be the gift and the opportunity? So I started looking at personal, professional, and then globally. So on a personal level, the gift and opportunity became, was the first easy thing to recognize. I'm actually staying home with my kids and my my wife and kids. So like, what's really interesting is I don't have I didn't have to get on an airplane at all this year, right? I, January through March, of course, but like oh. in terms of like all of 2020, all I most of the work that I did was all virtual. So one of the gifts and opportunities was more time with family. I actually was able to do all the work I needed to do through my computer and Zoom, and yeah. I did not have to get on an airplane. Fantastic. What else? Well, that also meant that I had deeper conversations with my kids because they, you know, outside of their video games, there wasn't much to do after school. So we ended up spending more time talking. We had dinners together. We started spending a lot more time together. And I've got these, I have two oh. boys that are teenagers. So a 16 and a 14 year old. So they're going to be off to college soon. So that was a huge gift. Another opportunity was how we came together as a family to really, it's like we're, we're forced to spend so much more time together than we ever normally would. And in that context, it was a matter of how can we truly be together in the ways we want to be together. So we got to co-create some new ways of being and structure that we didn't have in our family before. So that's on a personal level, right? Let me yep. branch it out. On a professional level, you know, as a coach and a trainer, the first thing I thought was this has got to be bad, 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 because I had, you know, six trainings that were, you know, mid to the end of the year and immediately they all got put on hold. Right. And so I was like, oh, no, because I was I was planning on, you know, flying around oh. to, you know, all sorts of parts of the country and it was completely put on hold. So how can this become a gift or an opportunity? So I looked at this and said, okay, well, if those things are on hold, then I get to look at what is the advantage of a global pandemic in the, from a business perspective. Well, first of all, it made all the sense in the world in coaching because people are really experiencing some of the biggest challenges in their life. They need a great coach. So my coaching oh. business exploded. So that was great. The second thing I looked at was, well, what about the trainings? Could I actually do this a different way? Could I create virtual trainings that were as powerful or more powerful than my physical trainings? And so what I did is I negotiated with the contract that I already had on the table, I said, okay, I'd like to try this as virtual. Initially, there was resistance, but when they realized how long and expanded this pandemic was, I was able to actually get them to agree to virtual trainings. And they were just, if not more powerful than what I'd done in, in person. And because of that, it's opened up all kinds of new opportunities globally to be able to do this work on you know multiple countries, because before that would have, the travel cost would have been too cost prohibitive. You know, This year, we actually had, had a lot more people from Europe participating in the trainings and things sure. that they've never had access to. Right. So, yeah. so, so let's keep going. What's the, 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 the good for the world? Like what's the gift and opportunity here globally? Well, we've already seen the reverse of some of the carbon emissions. We're seeing the fact that, you know, uh, animal life is thriving mm -hmm. a lot of the, the, a lot of different changes in the environment. So you start to see like how the, uh, and, and that's just like on a, on a nature scale on an ind individual basis, we have a global shared experience. While the pandemic itself is not what anyone wanted. We're sitting in a space and time in history where where we are all sharing the same experience across the globe, which means there's an interconnected mm. oneness that hasn't been there for a very, very long time. Very long time. So you can see like this is fascinating stuff because when you get to that same perspective, every outcome or circumstance can be turned into a gift or an opportunity. So I started challenging all the negative things I had in my mind about the time people who ripped me off financially or mistakes that were made and all that stuff and looking at what those gifts and opportunities were. And it really the back became- catalog of, uh, exactly. The back catalog of Venom. Venom. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> a great way to say it. Back, back catalog of Venom. So, so th this becomes a question is which perspective is true the saboteur that this is bad or the sage that this is a gift which perspective is true do you know it's a fascinating question i guess the perspective is you're looking at the negative from a positive through a positive lens and on a positive frequency trying to find the good of the situation which you know is, is going to put you in a positive place because i've had situations where i've had people rip me off I've had uh, people steal from me. I, you know, I've had many, many, many exactly. different things happen to me through my life. And, you know, I could write a book on the bad. Um, but, you know, what would be really interesting, I suppose, is the book of the learnings. Um, yes. Because what I got taught from those lessons was fascinating. And, you know, I've had, to, it's taken me years and to get into a certain place in my life where I'm able to look at my life 
um, through that lens. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, but I, I have moments where, you know, I am in that negative frame of mind. And it, you sure. know, but I, I think, you know, without, I, I've never, I've heard of parts of this methodology and, and parts of um, this. And what I found really interesting is you kind of gluing this together. It's kind of bits that I picked up. I've known about the primitive brain. I've listened to the chimp paradox, but to hear it in this way is, is, is very kind of different, but you know, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I can understand why people get, you know, stuck and they, when you only look at the negative, um, you know, it, it's, you're not going to see opportunity. And um, even when we got into this situation in the pandemic, yeah. yes, I probably was in a negative frame of mind for three weeks, but I managed to make that shift and see opportunity. And that's how we've come out the other side, having been bigger than ever. Um, but, you know, I wasn't necessarily aware of all these different, um, you know, <laughs> uh, ways of thinking, but it's it's in, it's enlightening. Well, and so here, here's the truth, right? So when I ask which perspective is true, which perspective is true, the saboteur thought that a global pandemic is bad or the sage perspective that the global pandemic is a gift? The answer is whichever you believe becomes true. Now, I can say this first and foremost because in March, I made the decision that this pandemic was a gift. And that I declared, if you even looked on my LinkedIn profile back in March, I made a declaration that said, I will make 2020 my best year ever. Not just a good year, my best year ever. This is a gift and I'm taking advantage of the gift. And I declared it all on my LinkedIn profile and everything I declared became true. I became a best-selling author. So I was an author before, but this I released my book, The Three Rules of Marriage. We talked about that on our last episode. Uh -huh. I became a, a, a best-selling author with that book. I have made more money in 2020 than I have ever made in my entire life, which is crazy to think about that in a global pandemic. But because of the ways in which we were able to monetize through virtual means, it was a phenomenal year, right? On top of that, the, the relationships with my wife, I mean, we just celebrated 20 years of marriage, have the most epic relationship. Thank you so much. And in that place, like like our marriage is fantastic. Our kids, our, the family has just never been tighter. Like every aspect in every domain of my life is better this year than it's ever been. And oh. why? Because I believed that this would be the case and I lived into it. So this idea oh. that this is a gift and I will not squander this gift was a declaration you know, in March of 2020. And that is what became true because I lived into that truth. S such a valuable lesson. And I think that you know, a lot of people who might have been coaches at the time thought, well, people aren't spending money on coaches. Um, you know, consultants are going to be cut left, right and centre. But I think, that, you know, even hearing you, the way you talk and, um, you know, the way you kind of assessed things and came to that judgment at the time, um, you know, was it, it's just a great way to look at life. And I think that a lot of people get all consumed in the problems and, you know, you can think of 99 potential outcomes to a problem. But, you know, I think you need to deal with things at the time and try to give yourself a bit of window shopping time. Yes, OK, look at problems, but, you know, let's try and look at the positive solutions and the positive outcomes most of the time. And, you know, I, I'm definitely going to be doing this uh, online survey uh, this evening, Bill. I feel Excellent. compelled to do it from yes, uh, yes, yes. a insightful point of view. So I, I guess kind of you've really given the kind of theory behind it and what people need to do. But can you give any advice to people to, you know, who are thinking maybe, yes, I do fall into that um, trap and I do keep thinking in that way. And, I, you know, I, I'm not necessarily, you know, sometimes the overwhelming um, negative thoughts kind of come into the mind. How can people get themselves into this 20 percent um, yes, bracket perfect. Um, if, that, if they don't feel they're in there now? It is the simplicity of the operating system of mental fitness, specifically positive yeah. intelligence. I'm going to tell you it's four steps and it's super, super easy and anyone can do it. And I'm going to share, I'm going to have you do an experience with me in just a moment, but let me tell you what the simplicity is. And I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to call, I'm going to call out a term that won't make any sense. And then I'll, I'll back it up with what it is and, and we'll do an experience of it. But it's really the four steps are this number one, if you're feeling negative emotions, stop you're in saboteur mode. So if you are experiencing any fear, anxiousness, un, you know, just doubt, pain, anguish, whatever it is, stop. You're in saboteur mode. That's all you need to know. Number two is we're going to do, I'm going to show you an example of this in just a minute, but we're going to do a PQ rep and I'll explain what that is and what we're doing, but you do a PQ rep to quiet your saboteur and activate your sage. So we're going to show you how to do that. 
And then okay. number three, you're going to assume the sage perspective that every problem can be converted into a gift or opportunity. And number four, you're going to generate the gift by using the sage powers like empathy, curiosity, creativity, calm, and clear-headed action. And in those areas, you are creating the outcomes you wish to see in the world. And that is how you actually attain the true potential that each and every one of us has. I'm ready. <laughs> so let's do a PQ rep, right? I, I, it sounds like something I normally do at the gym, but I am primed. But that's it. This is the mental gym. This is the mental gym. And you All can right, do it okay. anywhere, anytime, any place. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to yeah. do this. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if your audience is at a place where they can close their eyes, this is the best way to do it. If they're driving, please don't. <laughs> so you can yeah. do this with eyes wide open. But it's actually best. This is the one that my favorite that I go to. This is my go-to PQ rep. And there's like a whole bunch of versions we can talk about in a second. But my favorite one is I'm going to have you close your eyes. Right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to yep. do this as well. Good. Right. They're closed. And we're going to just breathe normally. And as you're breathing, notice the temperature of the air as it enters your nostrils and the temperature of the air as it leaves your nostrils. And any thought that comes into your mind, just let it pass and come right back to noticing the temperature of the air as it enters your nostrils and the temperature of the air as it leaves your nostrils. Now notice the rising and falling of your chest and stomach with each breath. And now listen for the furthest sound that you can hear. And now listen to the closest sound that you can hear. And if the closest sound isn't the sound of your own breathing, hear your breathing now. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Wow. That was very relaxing, Bill. Yes. You it, notice how you drop in your body? Yeah, definitely. I uh, felt a lot calmer after doing that. This is so simple. That's like one rep. Like you go into a gym and you do one rep. That was one rep, right? So you go through and you do this exercise. And the interesting thing about this is that while this gave you some very specific, you know, uh, impact, you got to have an experience of it. Lasting positive change is not the 20% insight. We've been spending most of our time on the insight, right? It's the 80% yeah. mental muscle. And so what's really important to understand is success requires this in almost intense initial practice. And this is the six-week six program that essentially gives you a challenge to do a version of the PQ reps for every every three hours for two minutes during your workday. So Tuesday through Friday, you start wow. off at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then every three hours, you do a two-minute version of what we just did. And you do that up until six o'clock and then you reflect on how your day went. What's interesting about that is, is that if you do this work for six weeks, you actually shift the neuro pathways in your brain. And where your default tends to be going toward negative emotions, it actually changes your neuro pathways to focus more on the positive. And it allows you to be in your stage more often. This is the self-command muscle. The ability to be in a moment and someone's heated coming right at you and you can stay calm. You can keep your Grounded. head. Mm. Exactly. Because here's the yeah. thing. I'm a huge fan of meditation. I've been meditating for 20 years, right? So I love meditation. I enjoy it. It's something I've done for a very long time. But the difference is with traditional med meditation or even traditional mindfulness, it tends to be in a controlled environment. And I don't mean to call it navel gazing because that diminishes way too much of what this is. It's so much more powerful than that. But if you can control the lights and the candles and the, and and sort of the your you know who's in your room with you, right? That's one level of mental fitness. But this is what we're talking about is mental fitness in the wild, like really, like yeah. when you're in the middle of a heated conversation with someone you care about. Boom! Can you keep your cool? And I think you make a really valid point there. I think a lot of people, you know, do practice meditation. It might be at seven o'clock at night after the end of the day, which is great to wind down. But I, I guess when you need this skill the most, uh, a lot of the time is during the working day when things are manic. And actually, you know, this, this sounds like an absolutely fantastic habit to get into. It doesn't sound like an easy habit because, 
again, people get consumed and they're not necessarily kind to themselves. And, you know, you're That's prioritized exactly right. dealing with a negative work matter than actually giving yourself. And in principle, it's only two minutes every three hours. How and long that's is that? it. You know, that's exactly it. And that, and that is the lie of the judge and the accomplished saboteurs. Mm. We don't have time mm. for this. It's two minutes. You have time to go to the bathroom in a three-hour time period? Of course you do. You can be doing the multitasking. You could be doing a PQ rep while you're washing your hands in the bathroom. Like you could literally do it, like being your mindfulness and your focus and all of that mm. stuff in there. But the thing is we lie to ourselves because our saboteurs are literally trying to control us, right? The negative self-talk is a, is a protection mechanism often developed in early childhood, never questioned. It becomes part of who we are. And it becomes our default. So it's our autopilot. And so what this program does is it shifts that and says, okay, hold on a second. Rather than staying and not questioning these negative self-talk components, what if we were to shift that and really look at them from a place of positivity? How can we activate our sage? And from that space, how, could, how would we show up differently? And so if you can interrupt your pattern, and that's why this is the work, when the repetition is the mother of skill. So if you can do this on a regular basis for six weeks, by the end of the six weeks, you've literally created new neural pathways in your brain. And if you were in an MRI scan, you would see that there's a different part of your brain lighting up more frequently at the end of a six-week program like this wow. because you're testing yourself, you're challenging yourself, and no matter what's going on, whatever circumstance is happening, you're able to show up with your best self. That's how people uh, get the 20% that achieve their true potential. That's it. And I, I think that's an absolutely beautiful way to finish the end of this episode. I think it all ties in so nicely. Um, where can people go, uh, Bill, to find out more about this? Because I'm sure this is going to pique a lot of people's interest. I know you mentioned, obviously, um, uh, positive kind of intelligence. Earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So, so well, what was the name of the book as well? So people can you got have it. that as a reference point. So, so I would say step one is positive intelligence.com slash assessments. So if just, if you go on to positive intelligence.com, click on assessments and you'll go to see the, the one we just talked about, the saboteur assessment, as well as the PQ assessment, you can take one or both of those assessments. The book is called positive intelligence by Shirzad Shamin. And uh, and the and the actual six week program is actually on the website too. So positiveintelligence.com slash program, you'll actually get all the details of the actual uh, program itself. And it is phenomenal work. It really has completely changed. And and you know from our last episode, I did a yeah. massive amount of transformational work with Tony Robbins. Love the guy. Have been, had all kinds of good work as a transformational trainer myself. I've had great great experiences in this work as a uh -huh. coach. Nothing has made a bigger impact in my life than this platform. And that's why you can I'm hear the a cash fan. You talk about yeah. it. You, you can hear it. You, you know, I can hear it in your voice. And it's a message that you want to spread. And, um, you know, in your introduction, you're obviously wanting to bring mental fitness to many, many yes. millions of people. And, right. you know, it sounds like every day is another step closer to that. So good luck in that. Um, if well, people want to find out more about you and about the, your book, and um, I know, obviously, as I said at the start of the episode, you can go and listen to the previous episode uh, where me and Bill talked uh, through detail um, through your absolutely outstanding and really interesting career. But where can people go to if they want to connect with you, Bill? So they to, a couple ways you can uh, LinkedIn is always a great way to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, but my website is billcarmody.com, and uh, my book The Three Rules of Marriage that website is threerulesofmarriage.com. Those are the two best places to connect with me, and uh, and of course you know I think this is a, it's a it's a great exploration into the work that we've been talking about as a foundation to other ways of really tapping into your sage perspective, and I'm excited as more and more people start to realize how they can do that on a regular basis it's awesome yeah i totally agree with you but there we have it bill thank you so much for joining me on this special episode titled why only 20 percent of lawyers achieve their true potential and how you can achieve yours and you know i think you heard it there and that sums it up thank you bill and this is the career success podcast i'm jason